The issue really isn't tolerance because they really aren't interested in tolerance. They're interested in forcing people to celebrate them, which is far different than celebrate, to not only celebrate, but to accept and to make sure that you do not criticize because criticism to them is violence. It is a violent threat to people. It is an existential threat to them if you criticize. And that is meant to, of course, take away your First Amendment rights to criticize. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We are honored to have this distinguished returning guest, Joel Skousen, an expert on both strategic relocation and defensive architecture, is here with us again on Liberty and Finance. Joel, thanks for joining us this Thursday, April 20th, 2023. Well, it's always good to be with you. You always have an interesting perspective on life. It comes from just, uh, I guess, an ordinary person's uh, experience of trying to figure out what's going to be good for their family. And going forward, we've got more and more of our family now with five children, 10 grandchildren, and and uh, soon to be 12 by the end of the summer. So uh, it's, it's uh, something that we look forward to with, I guess, as we get older, a more of a sense of the the joyful burden of responsibility on our shoulders to make sure that we're making prudent choices that are going to be good for our survival and thriving, but also for that of our children and of our grandchildren. And so we're trying to think strategically, and that's where you come in with your emphasis on strategic relocation and your emphasis on defensive architecture. Um, most recently, my wife and I just moved from Ohio to Florida. Uh, we look, we we're seeking. Uh, plentiful water, plentiful sunshine, long growing season, freedom loving culture, low taxes, among other things. Um, you've you've highlighted people uh, the benefits of perhaps the Pacific Northwest and mountain states in the past, other areas of the country that they've considered. But there's been what we are told to be record outflows, exodus, flight from places like New York, New Jersey, California, and some others. Uh, a little bit concerned now that Washington, my wife just informed me this morning, is da dabbling with the idea of imposing a some form of new tax. It's been a, a, a tax-free haven for some time. But anyway, uh, wanting to get your latest observations and uh, the fruits of your latest research on strategic location, particularly within the U.S., but if, there, if, if the discussion brings us broader than that, that's fine. But to get your thoughts on that, because you've looked very closely at that. You've written multiple books and updated them on that subject. So could you bring us up to your latest uh, observations and thinking on what people should be considering as they are either contemplating or in the middle of strategic relocation? Well, it's it's become very, very complex. I get a lot of requests to see when I'm going to update strategic relocation again. Uh, the latest fourth edition is... Uh, was updated just during the COVID regime so that I could warn people about the various different COVID uh, policies in, in different states. But now, uh, for example, in my weekly world affairs brief, which I write on the geopolitical situation around the world, um, it was called a mad, mad world. And it's because things are changing so rapidly now beyond the physical necessities of security and strategic relocation to the the moral problems that the world is facing, this fetish with transgenderism and or excessive tolerance of, um, you know, uh, reverse discrimination against whites, uh, homosexuality and transgenderism, as well as uh, vaccine policy, the denial of the damage to vaccines. All of these are very, very worrisome. In fact, it was probably the most popular world affairs brief I put out uh, in the past two years because I gave specific examples how our world is going crazy, not just because it's being imposed upon us as part of the Great Reset, but because people's ability to distinguish right from wrong seems to have deteriorated so greatly in our world that 
the majority of corporate heads, for example, are, are running headlong to be in compliance with this, uh, uh, you know, climate change with uh, carbon as a pollution, which is a, a bogus uh, um, a proposition used to control energy and control, uh, you know, what we grow, et cetera. Um, the UK and the Oxford University uh, just put out a report, which is accepted by the British government. Now is going to ban aircraft travel at airports. Within the future, it's going to ban the eating of pork and beef and lamb uh, in favor of uh, phony meats. Uh, I mean, this this is something that is very, very difficult to – when you have a global mad, bad world, as we say, uh, and, and a decline in, in, uh, in judgment about people to resist these type of things, it almost becomes impossible to escape – in the traditional ways of relocation, where you can escape the crime of uh, Chicago and uh, and San Francisco and Los Angeles by getting out to to rural countries, but to escape this type of thing is very very difficult to do. And so, I have encouraged people, you know, who who want more to subscribe to the World Affairs Brief because I'm not and I can't really possibly keep a physical book up to date on these fast changing moral declinations in our society and degradation that we're facing. But still, that said, the biggest enemy of everyone is population centers and population density, because it is in the big cities where these these crazy ideas uh, ferment and become prominent. And you have woke politicians in the democratic cities that are doing this. I mean, for example, San Francisco is a dying city because of these woke policies. Not only they're going bankrupt because of having passed a bill of giving uh, untold amount of dollars to all the blacks in the city for slave reparations. It's just a crazy idea. But you have homelessness that's taken over the downtown district. You have stores and elite shops in downtown financial data San Francisco that are going out of business because there's no clients. Nobody wants to go downtown because of all the homelessness and the and the crime that's ever present there. And the same thing is happening in L.A., uh, even in upscale places um, uh, like Santa Monica and Newport Beach. It's just destroying these otherwise beautiful, beautiful areas. Now, you've moved down here to or down to Florida, I see. And, um, you know, Florida looks like a very good haven right now because of the policies of, um, of Florida Governor DeSantis, which he is really doing a lot of good things to solidify um, the c conservative values and fight back against uh, Disney's wokeness and, uh, and other things. But. You know, you may get a lot of sunshine in Florida. It's still rated a zero rated state in strategic relocation. And the reason is that is because without electricity or in a wartime environment, which is surely coming, uh, you know, living in that hot climate without electricity with the insects and the bugs and other things is a very, very difficult thing to do. And if there is social unrest through an EMP strike that I have long predicted that will come um, – complementary of a nuclear war with Russia and China. Um, there's only a couple of exit routes out of Florida, so it's going to be very difficult to uh, to get out of those uh, those areas. So you want to be able to, and that isn't to say that you can't make it in Florida, uh, depending on where you are, uh, as long as you're not in Miami and some of the big areas. In the rural areas, if you plan properly, uh, you know, you can get significant self-sufficiency for the short time short term. Because of high water tables in Florida, it's also difficult to build a high security shelter in a basement area. But there are certain areas that are elevated that it can be done. So it isn't that I can't find as an expert, you know, fairly secure areas in almost any state, even New York, um, as long as you're away from the population centers. Uh, you do have to be worried about refugee flows when the electricity grid goes down. Because when you have population densities of a thousand people per square mile, like in the New York, Cor Washington, D.C. corridor, going clear up to Boston, when they start to spread out with no food and water in the big cities, it's going to be very difficult to evade that unless you're hundreds of miles away from those population density areas. And that's why the further west you go, excluding 
completely now the, the, the left coast, meaning Oregon, Washington, and, and, and California, which have become so woke. I mean, Portland is an unlivable city now. Uh, people have just, uh, and I was raised in Portland, so I know the city well. It was a wonderful place to be raised, but now um, it's crept over all of these types of, uh, of policies. Seattle is a downward declining city as well for the same reasons in, in Washington state. That said, you know, uh, there are a lot of beautiful places in uh, in the Sierra Nevadas and Northern California and Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon. Uh but, you know, it's part of a state that is basically intent on taking away your liberties, mandating vaccines and otherwise promoting policies that are driving good people out. Well, an, another problem besides these dying blue cities, which you don't want to be part of anyway, and that's where people are leaving the country in mass uh, to get out of those areas. Um, the problem in moving to the rural areas now is that we've had a, an extremely in, an extreme increase in cost in most of the desirable areas. I don't know what your experience was moving down to Florida in terms of cost, uh, but uh, prices in uh, uh, in Utah and Idaho, for example, my two top rated states there have literally doubled uh, in the past two years. And so it's made a lot of things unaffordable. And because there isn't that much land available in those areas, it's made it very difficult to even find supply uh, when the prices have they haven't really come down. They have gone flat, which is what normally happens in an inflationary cycle. Your prices rise and then they tend to go flat. They may decline a little bit here and there, but uh, they usually don't go down. Housing costs, for example, have leveled off, but they're not going down per, um, particularly. So one of the better areas now in terms of livability has been the, the Midwest, especially the states like Missouri or Oklahoma. Uh, and certain parts of Texas are still uh, far less expensive than the mountain states, which are probably higher rated in security because of the mountainous terrain and the desert terrain surrounding them that keeps the, the, the hordes from California reaching Idaho and, and Utah. It's 800 miles across Nevada desert to get there. But uh, uh, in terms of affordability, Missouri is one of the the better states in terms of uh, getting farm retreats. But you can still find good farm retreats in uh, eastern Texas as well as uh, uh, in semi-west Texas. It, there's a dry line about Abilene, Texas from Amarillo down to Abilene, and it gets really dry and desert on the west side of that line. And it's it's got uh, semi um, arid or nice, you know, you've got good well water and you can uh, irrigate pasture west of Fort Worth between there and Abilene. It's a pretty good area. But you want to stay away from southern Texas, not only around Austin area, which is a woke city uh, that is extremely democratic uh, or Democrat oriented, but you have this influx of the Mexican illegals coming into the southern half of Texas. Uh, and they do migrate up to the major cities, uh, but they generally are a higher density problem in San Antonio and other areas of South Texas. Well, we recently drove right across uh, South Texas and New Mexico uh, uh, around Christmas and New Year's and uh, Thanksgiving, going back to visit our children in the Phoenix area. And it was astonishing to see the poor air quality in, in Southern New Mexico with a whole bunch of power plants uh, and refineries and that sort of thing in that region. It was it was a landscape I've never seen anything quite like where for mile after mile after mile after mile, you just saw the, the plumes of the burning off from the refineries and, and power plants and that sort of thing. And the whole air tasted and looked and smelled with a haze. So if you're looking for what we thought would be high quality, uh, clear air and that sort of thing in, uh, in New Mexico, down along the Southern border is, is not where to find that. Well, that's right. And, um, uh, you know, Phoenix, if your children are in Phoenix, that's a, become a very highly degraded area now. Uh, even the conservative bastions of Mesa and Gilbert, Arizona, have been taken over now and invaded so that it's very unhealthy uh, politically and climate-wise um, everywhere in the Phoenix area. So in Arizona, of course, northern Arizona still is a bastion of fair low density, fairly low density and not too high altitude uh, uh, forestation, uh, lots of pine forests up there. Water is uh, definitely a difficulty in the Flagstaff area. You got to go down about 
2,000 feet to drill a, uh, a well. But there are other areas where the water is very close to the surface, um, and it's kind of hit and miss. You have to be very careful in, uh, in Arizona. But I want to make a statement also about the political issue when we were talking about Florida. I don't recommend people making a relocation decision based upon current political um, favorable circumstances. A few there are that find them. You know, most of your conservative states like uh, Utah and Idaho and Oklahoma and Texas have Republican legislators and Republican governors, but they're all rhino Republican governors. They're all mainstream Republican governors. They're all mainstream legislators that control the, the actual constitutional conservatives that really are for, uh, you know, limiting the, the social chaos that's going on in, in the world as well as uh, government intervention are always a minority, even in Utah and Idaho and Texas. Uh, and occasionally a governor like uh, Abbott in, in uh, Texas has been a problem in the past, has turned very conservative temporarily because he got a lot of backlash. Now, I think DeSantis is legitimately conservative. Um, and uh, But you've got to remember that uh, Florida has always been a swing state until recently, and it could turn Democrat again. There's a lot of uh, liberals still moving to Florida as well as conservatives, too. So you don't want to make relocation decisions based upon current politics because they can change. And I will tell you that every single conservative state is being targeted by the mainstream media in the major cities which control them, which are all Democrat, even in conservative states. Fort Worth and Dallas, Democrat-controlled uh, city. Austin, Democrat-controlled. Salt Lake City, Democrat-controlled. Boise, Democrat-controlled. Uh, and uh, Oklahoma City and, and Tulsa, et cetera. You've got a real problem in that they are working day and night to, to change the political atmosphere and corrupt the conservative values in these conservative states. And it is working. Now, it's still better there because the even though most of the conservatives are mainstream and asleep and depend on mainstream media, uh, they will resist when woke policies really come into, into vogue. And that's important to remember is that when you've got an 80% conservative majority in a state, there is a great deal of safety there, even if they're temporarily asleep. But if you get into a blue state where you've got a 60% uh, majority of, uh, of liberals that have a lock, lockdown tight control of the legislature and the governorship, uh, your liberties are lost and um, and economic liberties as well in the long term. When you mentioned about um, the areas that have gone with this, uh, whether you call it woke or whether you call it globalist or whether you call it uh, socialist uh, uh, ideologies that have proven themselves manifestly to be so destructive, so ineffective, so counter to the Constitution, so counter to... Um, any kind of a culture of personal responsibility and personal excellence and that sort of thing. Uh, we've interviewed Alex Newman, correspondent for the Epoch Times and others, who uh, talked to us about don't be, don't be snowed, don't be buffaloed by the fact that there's this or that favored group that is target that says, oh, this is the reason why you need to be uh, flexible and empathetic and compassionate and uh, tolerant to the point of giving up all your liberties to, to the to, to the point of uh, complete intolerance of even expressing your own viewpoint and everything he quotes uh, David Horowitz who says the issue is never the issue the issue is always the revolution and uh, in, in other words the cause whether inner city blacks or women is never the real cause but only an occasion to advance the real cause which is the accumulation of power to make the revolution and that always seems to result in the concentration of power in fewer and fewer elite hands and the loss of uh, autonomy and sovereignty by the individual, our privacy, our freedom, our ability to have build and have a future for ourselves, whether financially or practically in any way. Uh, so it, it's a serious uh, phenomenon that's happening, but it's also one that we're being misled about, intentionally misled and told, if you do this, it's it's going to be for the greater good. And it's, it's never for the greater good. It's for the good of a very elite few. And uh, we're all just sort of uh, herds in this in this um, movement. So can you talk to us about what people should do to, I guess, keep their head on straight and keep their 
feet on the ground, keep their eyes clear, clearly focused on what is real, what is true, and what they must do to uh, watch out for their family's best interest. First of all, uh, to reinforce what uh, Horowitz has just said and, and others, as I pointed out in my World Affairs Brief, um, the issue really isn't tolerance because they really aren't interested in tolerance. They're interested in forcing people to celebrate them, which is far different than celebrate, to not only celebrate, but to accept and to make sure that you do not criticize because the left views any criticism of any racial minority group or any uh, homosexuality or any transgender as violence. And that's a very important under, to understand. Criticism to them is violence. It is a violent threat to people. It is an existential threat to them if you criticize. And that is meant to, of course, take away your First Amendment rights to criticize. But, you know, one of the greatest uh, difficulties that we faced in this nation is the prevalence of anti-discrimination laws, because to discriminate is actually a fundamental right to make choices about who you will associate with and who you won't associate with is very closely tied to your First Amendment right, because if you are prohibited from discriminating or making discriminatory choices, then you're also prohibited from criticizing. And so it's a slippery slope going from refusal to be able to choose who you will serve in your own private. Remember the Supreme Court, after the um, Civil Rights Act was passed, made the decision that if you're a private business, you can no longer discriminate as to race because once you're open to the public, you now are a public accommodation and therefore not private anymore. It's a very bad decision that you lose your private property rights. And that now is being extended to if you own a home and you want to rent and you cannot discriminate, you've lost, lost your private property rights in the rental market as well. And so I don't know if we're ever going to be able to get back to that because when you talk about defense against these things, it really is impossible to fight against a wave that is backed by every academic, almost every academic in the university, except maybe Victor Davis Hanson. Um, it's almost never talked about. In fact, I'm probably the only one that's ever uttered the fact that to discriminate is a fundamental right. No one has bucked these things. Even churches have gone along with anti-discrimination rights, which is very, very sad because they have the First Amendment right to carve out an exemption for themselves. In fact, it was very unfortunate the, the Mormon church, the LDS church, went along with the anti-discrimination wave, but carved out an exemption for the church, but not for its members. In other words, the members couldn't discriminate, but the church could. Uh, so there's all these types of legal battles that are going on. and Legal freedom is one of the most crucial things in strategic relocation. I talk in the book about your freedom to do homeschooling, your freedom to do home medical birth. Uh, home birth is a very essential freedom now that hospitals are requiring vaccinations for newborns or they threaten to take your child away from you. You don't dare go into a hospital with your children of pediatric care. Uh, I mean, I've covered in the World Affairs Brief how people lose their children. Uh, through the threat because they will not vaccinate or they will not allow a healthcare worker to come in and dictate what type of establishment medical protocol that they're going to receive for a sick child. It's no longer the purview of the parent. The state has a compelling interest, they say, in the salvation of the child. Well, I don't care who's got a compelling interest. I want to know who's got the ultimate interest, and that is the parent in my regard. But you see, these are battles that you fight when you're talking about relocation. and there's two strategies. One, in terms of wokeness and uh, the propaganda that your children are receiving, the only real solution is to pull your kids out of public schools. I'm a strong believer that you have no control over public schools. I mean, when you go before school boards and try to get them to, you know, downgrade their pushing critical race ball, you get, I mean, in California now, there's a bill that is, will criminalize harassment of teachers if you criticize them about critical race policy. You can be fined up to $1,000 a day for harassing teachers and doing that at, at a school board meeting. So I say you cannot reform public schools. In fact, you should not reform public schools because they are 
they have a, an improper monopoly on property tax money which squeezes out the ability to private school. Now, we homeschooled all our children. We had to pay all those expenses and still pay property taxes. And so I don't believe in reforming public schools because, first of all, it cannot be done. And secondarily, uh, they are government schools. They are not our schools, as we're told on that. Uh, I believe also getting out of the establishment medical system and that means, and, and unfortunately, you know, you if you work for a corporation, you've got insurance. You can't use the insurance except in the establishment. And so you pay a penalty. But I'll tell you, for two generations now, and our three generations, my own personal family, my uh, uh, parents and all of our children, we never had medical insurance. But because our parents taught us how to be very, very careful about not doing stupid things so that you we didn't break legs, we didn't have major illness, and we ate properly, we've never had a major illness in three generations. I want that to sink in. But you have to eat right. You can't be overweight. You can't be eating junk food. You know, you you can't be doing stupid things on a trampoline and, and have a broken bone. You can't go skiing like bananas down a hill and get, and break a leg. You've got to be careful. And that's what, you know, teaching children about how to listen to the warning voice of conscience is very important. And um, I concentrate that on my website. I put a, a major essay there called The Still Small Voice of Conscience. And uh, it's free to read. It's a wonderful piece on how to listen to those promptings and those warning voices and and understand that whenever you make a mistake, you've been warned. You'll look back and check your conscience. Yeah, there was a warning voice there. And so much of our society could be remediated if people would get a better handle on conscience. And that's why in my essay last week in the World Affairs Brief on a Mad, Mad World, I talk about we've got a crisis of conscience in this nation. We just aren't listening anymore. You know, you've got bodies just riddled with tattoos. What about the nervous feelings that you feel when you're going to poke those needles in yourself? You know, you get warned that this isn't right. You're desecrating the body. You've got multiple piercings of ear rings and nose rings and eyebrow rings. And it's a mad, bad world, Dunnigan. <laughs> and there's no way to stop it. You know how the Lord tends to stop these things is he gives you war and hardships and extreme difficulties where people tend to say, you know, I guess the world isn't going to deliver on its promises. I need to go back to a divine source of assistance. People learn to pray. during it. Only some people repent during war. A lot of people get worse and very, very evil during war. But war tends to be this cycle of humanity where you get prosperity and, and increase and morality decreases, and then you go into war and crime and then come back up. But I'm afraid, and that's why I do have a section in strategic relocation on war. I believe this war, with Russia and China is going to be so devastating because of the EMP strike that will precede it and the nuclear attack on military targets um, about 15, 20 minutes later. Can you imagine a world without electricity for a year? And I mean a year because we don't stockpile any of the long distance transformers in this country. And they're all made in China. How are we going to get a supply of those transformers to rebuild the electrical grid? after you've absorbed uh, an EMP strike. Well, I can tell you that when you have pillaging going on for a year, you know, remember the movie, The Mad Max, and you have that kind of scenario happening and you don't dare drive on the highways. You can't even get fuel. Uh, and there's rape, uh, murder, pillage, uh, stealing. How long would it take to reestablish good feelings in society if you ever did re return out of that? I'm not sure we ever will reclaim and go back to the world. And this is very important in terms of the Great Reset. As I mentioned, you know, with them trying to outlaw vehicles and turn everything electric. Can you imagine with a world of electric vehicles when the grid goes down for a year? Everybody's stuck trying to resurrect old cars and find out how to refine gasoline. It's just not going to happen. And I think sometimes, and I'm a religious person, I think sometimes... The only way that the Lord can stop this kind of craziness in the world is to let it descend into war. Because I'll tell you, war will stop the Great Reset. 
you're not going to have an AI driven robotic society without a, an Internet and without electricity. You're not going to have any cryptocurrencies. There's no escape from digital currency except the grid goes down. And even the globalists need to have cash to be able to spend when the grid goes down. And you can't tell me they don't know that war is being planned because they want this war. They want to goad us into a global uh, global government. And that will make relocation even more difficult when you have a global government which imposes these same policies. But I, I'm more and more of the belief, Dunnigan, that this war will be so horrendous that um, we'll descend into an evil fighting evil and the only really protection there will be, will be like-minded, good, conservative, religious people banding together in rural areas where they came from and having a semblance of their own personal space, self-sufficiency, uh, a reenactment of some form of, of constitutional government in, in rural areas, even though the big cities will be lost. And so I think we'll have an exacerbation of the disunity, the divide within society into rural versus uh, megapolis uh, type societies. And, uh, you know, even the globalists will have to pay lip service to democracy that uh, how much they'll let us alone. I'm not sure. But I do know that only within rural communities will you, you survive. So anyone who's within a city who's listening to my voice, remember, you'll have to leave someday. When the EMP strike comes, you don't want to be in a big city. So if you want to, if you can't relocate, you can at least get to the periphery of the metro areas and commute into where you have to work and then hope that it doesn't happen when you're in the middle of, of downtown and, and have to get outside. But at least if you're at the periphery of the city, at least you can get out into rural areas to the retreats that you have hopefully planned for. And um, and get out before the traffic. You don't want to be stuck in a Katrina situation where all the freeways are clogged with cars out of gas. Joel, for people who do want to find your books and your current writing, you've mentioned two different things. One is your books. and You can tell us where they can find those, but also how they can get connected to get your current writing. OK, um, I've, I've gone off Amazon now. Uh, they tried to impose a million dollar liability policy on anybody who sold more than $10,000 a month. So I've quit Amazon, not only because they're a corrupt globalist organization. So my books are available at joelskousen.com. That's J-O-E-L-S-K-O-U-S-E-N.com. And uh, uh, so they're all readily available. The Secure Home, which is my 700-page uh, book about high-security construction. The High Security Shelter book, which is about how to do a high-security shelter, including fallout protection in an existing basement. And the Strategic Relocation, the fourth edition, which is available there as well. My other weekly writings, The World Affairs Brief, is found at worldaffairsbrief.com. And your listeners can get a free sample copy by clicking on request a sample on the left hand side and they'll get the current brief, which tells them how to subscribe. It's a modest fee of about a dollar a, a month. <clears throat> and folks, if you don't want to miss a single episode with Joel or with any of our other guests relating to how you can make, maintain your liberty and your financial futures, make sure you sign up for our free newsletter at libertyandfinance.com all spelled out, libertyandfinance.com. Just put your name, your email address, click submit. You'll get one email in your inbox per day with our latest interview, including those with Joel and with all of our other guests, as well as any weekly specials. Joel, on behalf of all of our viewers who are seeking how to take better care of their families, we appreciate having you in our corner and uh, glad for your presence here again on Liberty and Finance. Thank you very much, Donegan. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is a rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. 
Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within 3 to 5 business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, Call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.